17th. I am Donna Will, Professional Development Coordinator for the Developmental Disabilities Administration, and we welcome you to yes, the session Friday of our series of DDA updates. Our presenters for today are Bernie Simons, Deputy Secretary for DDA, and also with us is Dr. Kenneth A. Fader. He's a PhD. Um, he's the Epidemi Epidemic Intelligence Service Officer assigned to the Maryland Department of Health for Prevention and Administration. I'd like to go over a few things about the webinar. All participants are in listen-only mode. There are two options for listening to the webinar, by computer and by phone. And if you have trouble hearing, you may try switching by clicking on the appropriate button on the webinar panel. There is a handout for the webinar, and you can find it in the handout section of the panel to the right of your screen, or you can email me. We will be recording the webinar to post on the DDA website. Questions can be typed in the question box in the webinar panel. However, we will answer questions at the end of the presentation. So now I'd like to introduce Deputy Secretary Simons. Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome everyone who's uh, on this uh, webinar. I think we've maxed out at our uh, 500. So again, thank you for taking the time to uh, uh, look at our uh, updates. So uh, we're going to do uh, regional office updates like we usually do with a status of where we are. And then we're going to have Dr. Fader uh, do some uh, discussion um, from uh, an epidemiology uh, standpoint on, since he's uh, our resident expert for, from the Centers for D Disease Control. Um, so let me just say that, you know, again, we're trying to be as flexible as we can be. Um, we are moving forward. Flexibility has been addressed uh, through Medicaid to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services on the Appendix K that will allow us a, a lot more flexibility. Um, and we actually have uh, a set of questions that we need to respond to with Medicaid back to uh, CMS. Uh, they had some questions, um, not too many, and so, you know, I would hope that it wouldn't, I don't think it'll slow up uh, their process of uh, approvals. And in the interim, what we are doing is rather than waiting until we get the approval from CMS on Appendix K, we are also drafting guidance on how this would be implemented once we get the approval. So an example might be uh, when retainer days look like so uh, a retainer days concerning health and well-being um i appreciate the ongoing communication that you've been reaching out to us and i hope you've had the opportunity to read the resources that i shared this week on how to request uh, the go teams um, this is something that you can request through your local health department or through your local emergency agency. That is the, the protocol that has been set up. Um, I do not have um, uh, direct access to these people. They obviously uh, um, work through the local uh, health departments. Um, I can tell you that the many requests come in and that they go to a statewide review and then uh, uh, the assignments uh, for those teams are done uh, from there. So again, remember to go to your local health department and emergency uh, agencies, and they will be the ones to assist you. Um, I want to give you a little update of where we with the uh, regional statistics uh, that we've been doing. Um, South region, 56 uh, positive we have 20 results that were we have had uh, pending right now we have had uh, we have had a one is pending and there have been no deaths 
In the central region, we have uh, 24 confirmed positives, 26 negative, seven pending. And again, unfortunately, we've had uh, deaths in the central region. The West region had eight confirmed positives, were negative, two were still pending. Again, unfortunately, deaths in the West. Um, I think that we can change in resources. So that we're all in this. Make sure that. Uh, that, we, that application. That, you know. Possible because we don't. Hey, Donna, we have Dr. Feder on the line. Hi, yes, this is Kenny Feder. Hi, Dr. Feder. We're having some technical difficulties, but if you could, I'm going to ask Donna to mute everybody else, um, including Bernie, so that CFB can help with this um, um, uh, uh, system that we're having slow today. So if you can just um, go ahead and um, and start talking about um, your discussion and I'll go to the agenda the, of your slide on the screen. Uh, okay, well, thank you very much for having me. Uh, I'll be briefer today than last time because I don't have slides, but I did want to come back because I know there were some uh, sort of residual questions from the last time I spoke. Um, so I'm just going to try to touch briefly on some of the big themes that appear on the agenda and then turn straight to taking some questions that uh, were sent to me beforehand by Tanya, and then spend the rest of the time answering questions. Um, and unfortunately, I wasn't able to get on to the webinar except on my phone, uh, so if someone would be so kind to read the questions to me out loud, uh, that would be fantastic when we get to that point. So I guess the first thing I want to talk about is working with local health departments. So the key to responding to, preparing to and responding to a COVID-19 outbreak is working closely with the local health department of the community where the program that has a possible COVID outbreak resides. Um, and, um, you know, local health departments will be your primary ports of contact to discuss infection control, to discuss testing, uh, to discuss personal protective equipment, to pr discuss other infection control measures, and they'll be closely communicating with the state so we're aware of what's happening in your program. Now, unfortunately, um, one of the challenges, you know, there's a lot of challenges facing local health departments as well. Um, most of the outbreaks they deal with are, uh, you know, nursing home or long-term care outbreaks. Uh, so these are a bit different. Um, and so I think it's important when approaching the health departments uh, up front, uh, particularly because this can be a stressful situation and stuff can get lost in communication, uh, to, you know, call the health department and say, hi, I'm calling from X program. We are experiencing an outbreak of COVID-19 in a residential program. A member of the program who lives here has tested positive, or a staff member who works for such and such program has tested positive. Um, you know, please offer recommendations about how we should proceed. Um, that way will help make sure that the local health department, A, fully understands the situation so they don't think that it's um, this like an outpatient program or something like that, where they would not consider that to be an outbreak and might not prioritize. And then B, you know, can sort of work with you the way they would any other outbreak and understand um, sort of work to understand the particulars of your situation. Um, one thing that I think can sometimes happen is um, members of the public or people from who 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 uh, aren't sort of prioritized programs will call and say hi you know uh, somebody at xyz had COVID-19 and now you need to test everybody um, and what will happen is is if it's a call center the call center will probably say no we can't test everybody and then they won't respond for that person and so they may not pick up that it's an actual outbreak if um, uh, uh, an outbreak in a DDA program is reported that way. 
Um, and so just that first communication is key. Um, and then the State Department of Health is also a resource. And so if you're having trouble reaching a local health department or you're having, you know, you have a question that you feel isn't being addressed, you can always call the State Health Department at 410-767-6700. Um, and there's a rotating team of epidemiologists there who are there to support you. Now, in terms of the testing processing, there's a lot of questions about who gets tested and how testing is done. So, um, so our recommendation is at minimum to try to test everybody who develops symptoms uh, that could be consistent with COVID-19 in a group or residential program like a DDA uh, program. And so, you know, for residents in those programs, uh, you would work with your local health department. They would provide specimen collection kits. You would return those specimen collection kits to the local health department after collecting the specimens. Or maybe uh, if you don't have a, a nurse or clinical staff who can do that collection, the local health department would help collect those specimens for you. Um, and those specimens would be sent to the Maryland State Public Health Laboratory. Um, and the reason that we ask that you test residents who have symptoms at the state laboratory is because, with very limited exceptions, we're usually the fastest option. However, our primary concern is taking the fastest option. So if there, for some reason, is some other delay reaching the state lab, it is appropriate to try to work with a community partner like a hospital or a private laboratory reach out and see if there's a fasting texting mechanism if you're having trouble uh, reaching the state lab, reaching the local health department, or for some reason they're not able to provide testing kits. Um, and, uh, okay, so then as far as everybody, so that's for symptomatic residents. For any staff who develop symptoms, we do strongly recommend they be tested. Um, that would often be done by them going through like a drive through testing center or setting that up through their primary care provider. Uh, but since they are staff in a group home program, they would be, they should be able to access that testing. Now, in terms of people who are not experiencing symptoms, who are just exposed. So we don't generally do that testing through Maryland Department of Health laboratory um, for two reasons. One is just because we try to make sure we are prioritizing testing for people who are having symptoms because of limits on testing capacity. And the second reason is because um, uh, if for a variety of reasons, if you test negative, our results, our recommendations don't change. In other words, if you're exposed to COVID-19, we have the quarantine recommendations that I discussed last week. Um, and if you test negative, you could still later become sick and test positive, and so we still recommend that quarantine period if it's possible. Now, if you test an asymptomatic person and they test positive, then you know they have COVID-19 and they can be isolated or excluded. Um, and some programs sometimes do that on their own, uh, but Maryland State Public Health Lab, we are prioritizing testing of persons with symptoms. Now, I know there have also been a lot of questions about the GO teams, and I think that was discussed earlier. Uh, I don't. I'm not the, the, the primary point of contact for the, uh, the GO teams, but I can talk a little bit about what they've done at other programs, which is, you know, there's a couple of things they can help with. Um, they can help with, so first of all, the, the most, you know, one thing they can help with is infection control. So they can come and they can help assess the situation and determine if there might be places where infection control measures can be improved to stop spread between residents or from residents to staff. And then they can help provide recommendations, and then they can also provide material resources sometimes to help implement those recommendations. The second thing they can do is, is that in a place where a lot of testing needs to be done and there's some kind of backlog or they decide some further testing needs to be done, they can test more. Um, and then the third thing they can do is they can help with stabilization. I think this is maybe less of an issue in a, a, a DDA program than it would be at a nursing home, but essentially, if if uh, a program reaches the point where uh, people's clinical health needs are no longer able to be cared for because they're so short-staffed or they're in a severe crisis, these National Guard GO teams can come in with teams of health professionals and help make sure people are appropriately triaged, brought to the hospital, and cared for in the event that that should be uh, required. So uh, that's those three topics. Now I'm going to turn to some specific questions that were sent to me uh, from the after the previous webinar. And I'll just read these questions and then tell you uh, what my answer to them is. And um, then after that, I'll take more questions. So the first question is, what is the low temperature that we should be concerned about? 
So I would say anything 99 or above is concerning. So anything over 100, I would test immediately. Anything over 99, I would, you know, retake the person's temperature maybe like two, four hours later and uh, see if they're still elevated above 99, I would test for COVID-19 um, because symptoms can be very, very mild. Is a throat culture a valid way to test for COVID-19? Is a throat culture a valid way to test for COVID-19? The answer is yes. COVID-19 can be tested for through a throat culture, but it's not the preferred way to test for COVID-19. So uh, a nasal swab is preferred. Sometimes there are resource limited situations where folks have throat swabs uh, and they don't have nasal swabs. In those instances, uh, you know, it needs to be appropriately labeled as a throat swab. Um, and that swab can be sent to MDH lab just like a nasal swab would be, and they will test it, but a nasal swab is better. It's more likely to produce a correct result. Uh, what are some circumstances that compromise the integrity of a cloth face mask and should be changed? What are some circumstances that compromise the integrity of a cloth face mask and should be changed? That's a good question, and unfortunately, um, there's not a lot that's known about this uh, because recommending cloth face masks for members of the public is new. Um, here's general guidance I can offer. So the first is that the goal of a cloth face mask is not primarily to protect the person who's wearing the mask. Anybody who's doing a medical or healthcare procedure that would typically require a mask to protect them should wear a medical mask. The purpose of the cloth mask is to protect um, everybody else. In other words, if the person wearing the mask has COVID-19, uh, but they don't know it yet, or they do know it, um, and they're wearing it because they have COVID-19, the mask protects the people around them by stopping their respiratory droplets from getting out and getting to others. Um, the second thing to know about masks is that in general, when masks are worn, uh, it's best to only touch the straps of the mask and never touch the front of the mask. And this is true of all masks. Um, and that whenever you take your mask on or off, you should wash your hands or use alcohol paste hand sanitizer to perform hand hygiene. And that touching the outside of the mask is considered contaminated. So if you do end up touching the outside of the mask, then you want to immediately perform hand hygiene. Um, and then finally, it's it's good to regularly wash the masks. So if they're cloth masks, you know, try to wash them as, as frequently as is really feasible, I guess. Um, okay, will there be, uh, when will there be a blood test for antibodies for COVID-19? Uh, and then for individuals with other serious illnesses. So I think there actually already is um, some antibody testing available. It definitely exists. It definitely exists at the CDC. And I believe our state public health lab has the capacity to do it. Um, however, how it should be used appropriately is more complicated. Um, and so we're not doing it any kind of wide scale basis that I know of at this time. Uh, there's two reasons. One is because we, we don't know yet when a person who's sick with COVID-19 actually develops antibodies. So a person might have COVID-19, but if you tested for antibodies, you might not see the antibodies yet. And so, you know, the PCR test, the one that we were doing with the nasal swabs, that's that's the one we're still using to diagnose COVID-19 in people who are sick or who think we might be sick. We think that's probably better for the time being. Uh, the second thing, and I know there's a lot of interest in sort of using antibody tests to test for immunity. In other words, to say, okay, I have antibodies, so then I'm safe. Uh, but there's still a lot we don't know about that. And so um, we don't want to offer people false assurances by testing them and seeing antibodies and saying, oh, you're immune to COVID-19, but then not actually being certain that they are immune to COVID-19. So at this time, there's no, we wouldn't recommend trying to obtain antibody testing to see if you're immune and then, you know, using that antibody testing to just uh, stop taking other precautions. The other precautions are still recommended. So the question, there are significant delays getting test results back. Can PPE be provided when a person has presumed COVID-19? The answer should be yes. And I think this is where it comes back to close communication with your local health department um, and, you know, with the state health department and DDA uh, and really just trying to take every avenue to obtain PPA, PPE, uh, both in advance, if that's possible, and then also, um, you know, re-requesting it if there's an outbreak situation or an outbreak-like situation. Um, and then also, uh, you know, having close communication with the local health department, because if you have somebody with suspected COVID-19 and it's a first case, 
really trying to get that specimen collected and tested through the Maryland Department of Health lab. Um, because if that can be done, then it can be done faster, and you can get those results back faster. So yes, PPE should be provided when a person has presumed COVID-19 and should be used when a person has presumed COVID-19. Uh, there are three individuals in a home. One has symptoms or tests positive. Do you recommend we move the other two individuals to another setting and quarantine, or do we keep them in the home and isolate all of them? It's a good question. Um, I think what we would, it's an excellent question. So, so the person who has symptoms needs to move into isolation, obviously. The people who are well should do a 14-day quarantine. So how that's operationalized can depend on the setting. Typically, I think we would not recommend transferring those people to another program and instead taking infection control precautions uh, within the program where they are. Uh, the reason being that, unfortunately, since those folks were already exposed, uh, some of them may already be ill and not just showing symptoms, and so we don't want to spread COVID-19 to a new program by moving those two residents. So the best case situation is we can safely quarantine and separate those folks from the ill resident uh, within the program that they're in. And that's also just, you know, I think the, the, the easiest thing in terms of keeping people the environment they're familiar with and most comfortable with. Um, having said as much, if there is some designated quarantine plan or structure that involves moving people into another location where they can safely be isolated and where maybe there's more adequate infection control or personal protective equipment that's available for some reason, then that is an option. The key thing is to just not immediately transfer folks out to another program uh, where those folks could then cause the outbreak to spread from one program to another. Will just wearing a mask prevent COVID even though your eyes are exposed? No, that's a great question. Your eyes have to be protected. Um, and so if you're working with somebody who's confirmed to COVID, suspected COVID-19, eye protection is the recommendation. You should have eye protection. Otherwise, if the person does have COVID-19, then you're exposed. Um, so obtaining that eye protection can be really important. And uh, this is a recommendation I never like giving, but the, the, the truth is, is that if you're struggling to maintain, re, uh, obtain eye protection, improvising is better than doing nothing. And so that means, you know, sometimes we have folks working in swim goggles or other kinds of goggles like that. And we think that's appropriate or rather it's not appropriate, but it, it, if, if, if other eye protection isn't available, we would advise doing that um, because it, it, it is important to protect your eyes. Can disinfectant spray be used on masks and left in the sun to detox for reuse? I don't believe so. I'm not an expert on disinfecting masks. I apologize. I will try to get back with an answer about that, but I think the answer is no. There are ways to correctly disinfect masks. Uh, and probably a better way to answer the question would be sh by sharing those guidelines with DDA, and I will try to do so. How can families know if there's exposure? Um, I'm not sure exactly what that question means, but essentially, if somebody has COVID-19, a person is considered exposed if they had direct contact with that person, if they were within six feet of that person for more than 10 minutes, if they provided health, meta, or medical care to that person, uh, if they were directly coughed on or sneezed by that person, or if they shared an indoor environment with that person for an extended period of time. Uh, and again, the recommendation for exposure is a 14-day quarantine unless you're a uh, critical infrastructure personnel or healthcare provider, in which case you can end that quarantine early and go back to work, uh, just to make sure there's no staffing shortages. Um, okay, so there's a question about social distancing. Social distancing in the home, uh, residents staying in their rooms as much as possible is how I described it on the webinar. In a residential group home with three residents and two staff, is that really necessary or is that more applicable to larger homes or facilities with many rooms and clients? So the basic idea, it's a great question. Um, the basic idea of social distancing is, is that everybody wants to stay physically distant from everybody else as much as possible. Uh, solitary recreation is okay, um, and virtual recreation is okay, and both of those things are encouraged. So in a small program with three residents or two staff, you know, if, if you can be certain that if residents are not in their rooms, they're engaging in solitary activity, um, that, that might be okay. The challenge becomes um, droplet and contamination, right? So if folks are leaving their rooms, uh, you know, their respiratory droplets could be getting on surfaces and then other people could touch those surfaces. 
Um, and so, you know, the more people can, that's, and that's why we recommend universal masking is in part to prevent that. So, you know, again, we don't want people to go stir crazy and we understand that this can be extremely challenging and for your residents. Um, the goal is to physically distance as much as possible. Um, and at minimum, that means being six feet apart from each other. If staff need to be in close contact with residents and there's an out concern for an outbreak situation, then you would want to be in full personal protective situation. Or if the resident has COVID or suspected COVID-19, full personal protective equipment would be the, the, the recommendation. And yeah, that would be the recommendation. Um, question is, what should be done when isolation will not be complied with by the individual served? That's a great question. Um, that does happen sometimes. So I think the answer then is to try to use innovative approaches that meet that individual's needs and the other residents of the program. In other words, if that person won't stay in their room or won't comply with isolation or has to have social contact with others, try to help put other residents in a position where they won't be inadvertently or involuntarily brought in contact with that person who won't comply or is unable to comply with the instructions and instead have that person being in contact with staff who are able to take uh, appropriate precautions uh, to be prepared for that. So in other words, if a person can't stay in their room or doesn't understand the instructions and keeps leaving, then try to engineer a solution so that other folks won't inadvertently come into contact with them. Um, we've heard so many variations of who gets tested. Can you tell us if testing is available with those for mild symptoms such as scratchy throat, sore nose, sore throat, nasal drip, um, alleg that may be allergy related? How would you know when to seek testing? If you uh, are a resident or an employee of any kind of congregate or group home or DDA program, we would recommend seeking testing at the mildest symptoms. If you're having trouble getting access, explain that you are part of a congregate program and it could be the beginnings of an outbreak. Um, so yes, a low threshold is very appropriate for testing. People who have mild symptoms get tested, especially if there's potential concern for an outbreak. Uh, residents, that can be done through Maryland Department of Health Lab, but again, Make sure when you communicate with your local health department, say there's concern for a COVID-19 outbreak, um, and make sure you're taking proactive measures in the event that testing is delayed. Uh, is it better to wear a mask even if people with intellectual or developmental disabilities are not cleaning them regularly? That's a great question. I think the answer is probably it's the goal of the mask is to protect others, right? So if folks are able to wear that mask, um, um and uh if, other, if folks are able to wear that mask then it helps protect the people around them in the event that the person wearing the mask is already sick and they don't know it yet um the other thing is is that masks help people from not habitually touching their faces uh, and this is true for everybody you know we all touch our faces a lot it's very hard to not do that um and so when you're wearing a mask if you're touching your face uh, the mask prevents you from touching your mouth or your nose and accidentally putting virus or respiratory droplets in your mouth or nose. So I think all other things being equal, the mask, masks are advantageous. Uh, but as soon as they're removed, if if somebody's doing something that could potentially contaminate the mask, you know, they should immediately wash their hands or perform hand hygiene. It's good to help them with and then also try to wash the mask. Um, are Tylenol, uh, Retilever, Ritanavir, uh, uh, Tocilizumab, and corticosteroids good for uh, good for COVID treatments? So I don't know if I'm familiar with all of these. I uh, apologize. So let me. I think there's two ways something can be good for a COVID treatment. I'll try to talk about this generally. The first is whether something helps relieve the symptoms of COVID-19. Um, so that's like taking a fever-reducing medications, and I think those probably work the same for COVID-19 as they would for any other illness. In other words, if somebody's taking fever-reducing medications, it'll reduce their fever. Um, the second is whether something actually helps cure COVID-19. In other words, reduces the probability of you having a bad outcome. At this time, we don't have any treatments for COVID-19. Uh, there's no treatment that is known to actually fight the virus and improve people's health. Uh, Corticosteroids in particular, I think, are not recommended. There are concerns that corticosteroids could make things worse, except for very unusual extreme situations. 
Um, but in general, there is no treatment for COVID-19. And I know there are discussions of various new or hypothesized or experimental treatments in the media. Uh, and I hope that some of those prove to be effective, but also they have known uh, side effects or consequences. And so uh, at this time, I think it's best to proceed on the assumption that there is no uh, no treatment for COVID-19 unless you're working with a clinician in a specific circumstance who recommends something for a specific reason in a very extreme situation. Are there any recommendations for managing individuals with behavioral cognitive sensory issues who will not keep a mask on or are unlikely to remain in their room? So I think I've touched on that already. Uh, it's obviously an extremely challenging situation. I think it's basically about trying to meet the person where they are and then also trying to put you know controls in place to protect the other residents in the event that one person is having trouble you know following instructions or protecting themselves. And then who is at greater risk for COVID-19 in the developmental disabilities population? Uh, unfortunately, I don't know. I, I don't have a great research-based answer to that. I think in general, anybody who's in close contact with other people or has struggle following has trouble following instructions about hand hygiene or social distancing is going to be at greater risk for contracting COVID-19. Uh, and then once you have it in terms of who's at greater risk of having a bad outcome like hospitalization or death, that's really more about underlying medical conditions. So people who are immunocompromised, medically fragile, uh, older, older is probably the biggest risk, or have like heart disease, lung disease, or kidney disease, those would be at the highest risk for poor outcomes. So that's it. That's Dr. all the questions I've received. And oh, I will thank stop you so there. Much. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so some of the questions that we've getting from providers specifically is what should they bring or how should they be communicating with the health department to understand the population that uh, we are working with? Um, I think, well, it starts by calling, uh, I think, you know, it's a great question. I, I, is the question about specifically communicating that there is an outbreak happening or trying to get general questions answered about um, COVID-19 if it were to affect your program. I think for general questions, the best place to start is with DDA, with these webinars, with trying to use the preparedness resources that are provided. Um, and I think if there's a specific inquiry about suspected or confirmed COVID in a home, then the way to start is by calling the COVID-19 hotline or the communicable disease program for the local health department, saying that there is an outbreak of COVID-19 in your program and then waiting to be put through to whoever is responsible for receiving that outbreak report. Um, and then again, you know, the State Department of Health is also an option, 410-767-6700. Uh, but we, you know, the local health departments are closer to you and uh, they can do more for you, uh, including like arranging for PPE and things like that, that if we want to do those things, we have to go through the local health department anyway. So, so can you tell there if you can. Thank you. Can you explain a little more about the components of the GO team? Yeah, I think there's basically three different things GO teams can do. Like I said, um, they can come in and do infection control assessments. That means basically they walk through uh, the program and then they say, okay, you know, um, they, they see what's happening and then they make recommendations for how things could be improved to help reduce spread of COVID-19. So often those are recommendations about appropriate use of hand hygiene, about the situations in which residents are living. Um, they can help with if there's any challenges related to personal protective equipment. For example, if people aren't taking on or putting off they're actually putting on and taking off their equipment correctly. They can help offer guidance about how to do that. Um, you know, uh, recommendations about cleaning, really anything about how to control spread. Um, a second thing they can do is um, they can help test. So if there's challenges getting texting, sometimes they will come in and say, okay, you know, these folks, We've right now identified that they're symptomatic in a way that might not previously have been identified. Uh, we'll test them, or there'll be other high-risk exposures, and they'll just make a decision to test. So they can help with testing. Uh, and then the third thing they can do is if there's like a clinical crisis, they can help stabilize that situation where folks are having immediate medical needs that are not being met because of the level of strain on the program. I think that's probably less likely to happen here, but that's also something that the National Guard GO teams can help with. 
Is it still true that um, to go to the health of departments before it gets tested, um, the provider will or the staff need to have a doctor's prescription? Um, that varies depending on the particular testing center. So if it's the health department, I mean, if it's a resident of a program, the local health department will work for you, with you to test the resident right away. There's no need for a prescription for a resident. If it's staff, in other words, it's a member of the public who's otherwise capable of accessing a drive through testing center or something like that, or going to a primary care physician, then probably uh, a doctor's recommendation, a, a, a prescription would, would normally be necessary for that. However, um, it may be possible to work with local health departments or with the State Department of Health to expedite that process because, for example, if the local health department says you should be tested, then you can be tested. Um, and if there are concerns on a case-by-case -case basis, we can try to help address that. Yeah. What What are your thoughts and recommendations when someone has been COVID positive and now they're being ready to be discharged to a congregate setting? What should providers uh, be prepared for or, or you think would be the primary thing for them to react to? So I think the most important thing is to have a safe environment for where that person can be cared for away from other people. So you want to have a designated space where you're prepared to receive somebody who's COVID-19. And that space should ideally be totally physically segregated from the rest of the program. So nobody should have contact with the person who's discharged into your program uh, during the duration of their illness unless they are healthcare providers or staff who are caring for that person. Anybody who's caring for that person should be using full personal protective equipment, and then that personal protective equipment shouldn't be used with other residents. In other words, it should be strictly dedicated to, well, uh, you know, the mask you're wearing throughout the facility. But in particular, there's been challenges on uh, with gowns. So it, it's not appropriate to wear a gown while working with somebody who has COVID-19 and then wearing that same gown for somebody who doesn't have COVID-19. So the, the gown for a person with COVID-19 should be, should be dedicated uh, to that person. Um, you know, immediately performing hand hygiene when after, before entering, working with the patient, and then after leaving. Um, and finally, the gold standard is that if there's somebody with COVID-19 in your program, they should have dedicated staff. In other words, whoever is working with that person with COVID-19 isn't working with other residents, and then whoever's working with the other residents isn't working with the person with COVID-19. And that last step is sort of the insurance policy that really helps prevent any spread. Okay, um, this is the last one. Is uh, what reassurance do you suggest that providers share with their staff when they're in fear of working with people who might have been um, exposed or who are um, COVID positive? So I, uh, this is the toughest question, and because people's fears are real and they're not unwarranted. Um, I think the most important thing is regular communication, ideally sort of, you know, often, you know, via more than email or letter. In other words, giving people a forum to be told something verbally and then to be able to ask questions and then answer questions. And it's sometimes, you know, to be transparent about what you do know and transparent about what you don't know. And then also, you know, really being very, very um, working as fast as possible to work with local health departments in the State Department of Health to make sure that your resources are met so that staff are safe when they're working with your residents because we never want staff working with somebody who has or could have COVID-19 without appropriate uh, personal protection and access to hand hygiene. That should, we, we, we want that to never happen. Um, and so, you know, the first step is making sure staff are safe, and then the second is being having really, really good communication to address concerns, um, to understand what they are, and then try to either address them or be honest about the ways they can or can't be addressed. Thank Dr. Federer, thank you so much for uh, being a guest today, and we will be reaching out. If any of the listeners have further questions, please send them to us or either through the DDA Toolkit um, email address. 
Um, I know that during the beginning of the broadcast, we had some technical difficulties, and some of you have asked if we could share some of the data in reference to the region. I'm going to turn this over now to our Deputy Secretary, who is going to do an overview of his um, presentations mm -hmm. and some updates. So, um, Bernie? Yeah, again, I, I apologize for our technical difficulties. We need to get better uh, at this. Um, so, um, what I presented earlier um, was that in the South region, um, there are 56 confirmed positive uh, cases. There were 21 tests resulted that were negative. Um, we have 22 that are pending um, that we hopefully will get the results soon. And unfortunately, we have had uh, four people uh, die. In the East region, we've had one confirmed positive. Uh, eight tests were negative. There is still one pending case, and there have been no deaths. In the Central region, there has been 24 confirmed positive cases. 26 tests resulted in negative. Seven are pending, and again, unfortunately, we have had three deaths in our central region. And then in the west region, we have had eight confirmed positive uh, tests. Uh, eight tests were negative. We have two pending. Uh, again, hopefully those results will be in soon. And again, unfortunately, we have had uh, two deaths in the West region. So, Bernie, um, a couple so, of questions. Yeah, go ahead. Um, for providers who are dealing with uh, folks who have been identified COVID positive, what um, do you think that the department or the DDA can uh, support providers when they're dealing with this crisis? Well, I think that the, if the providers have someone, and again, we know that uh, we have uh, people who are confirmed positive about, so I guess the question is, what is the ask? Um, because I'm not really sure what the capability or what the resources currently that that uh, individual provider might have. I would ask that you would go through your uh, regional director um, and that you would keep uh, Tanya Ferguson, Patricia and myself also uh, in the loop so that we can uh, assist you um, as best as we can. I mean, that might be looking for um, uh, additional uh, PPE, it might be, um, I think we have this in Appendix K, that we would um, pay an enhanced rate for staff who were um, actually working with individuals that were um, confirmed positive. Um, we did do a uh, survey. Um, I I think we got many of our providers. If we didn't, I would ask the providers who are on uh, this webinar, or if you know somebody who is not on the webinar, if you could reach out to them so that they could do an ask through the regions about what their needs are. And that could be uh, supplies. Uh, we have reached out and asked people if there's been a problem with obtaining either cleaning supplies or disinfecting supplies, or uh, if there's been a problem with obtaining food, and we're basically here and know that there are no issues uh, with that. Bernie, there's some more Rhonda. questions. Can you unmute, Ron? Hi, Bernie. This is Rhonda. Can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Okay, great. There were a few questions. Um, 
to the question box. One of them had to do with Appendix K and asking whether the DDA would be requesting more than 18 retainer payment days from CMS. Well, since you're our resident expert and our uh, liaison to Medicaid, why don't you answer that? I would be happy to do that. Thank you, Bernie. Um, so just a reminder for our callers, um, last week we shared an update related to Appendix K. Um, in our request to the, CM, um, to the federal government, we have asked uh, for permission to be able to provide up to 30 days for our meaningful day services and our residential services. What we have been advised and informed by CMS and by our Medicaid partners in Maryland, um, currently under this um, authority that we're requesting exceptions to, we can only request up to the state nursing facility bed hold days that is outlined in the Medicaid state plan. Right now in Maryland Medicaid state plan, um, the nursing facility bed hold days is currently set at 18 days. That means at this time, unless um, there's changes on the federal level or in the state plan, um, that's the uh, maximum authority that we are able to um, be granted at this time. I mean, there was another question um, that came, wanted to know the new go would be available um, for people self-directed. Um, PPE also available for people who are self-directing. I was getting third word. So I thought is the question of people who saw being eligible to get PPE. Answer is yes. yes. And, and we have um, get PPE given yeah, and, and we've given supplies to people who are self say that again. I'm sorry, Bernie, that I'm breaking up. They want to know if they have access to the go teams too. Yes. Great. I mean, Another again, I mean, you've got, again, people that need to go through the health department. But I would not see uh, an issue where we could not say, you know, you're part of the uh, Developmental Disabilities Administration, you're self-directing your services, and we are requesting assistance for uh, X. Great. And then there was an, one additional question that asked, um, if in the Appendix K there was going to be some flexibility um, in the ability to hire family members as staff? Well, my memory says yes, but again, you were the primary contact on that, so. Yes, sir, and um, that is correct. We have um, requested the ability um, to hire um, family members and to make exceptions to um, the training and onboarding so that staff including family members that would be serving as staff can begin services sooner. So those are the questions that I have um, at this time. And Bernie, those are the questions that I have too at this time. So we'll let you uh, close. We have uh, two minutes left. Yeah, again, uh, I want to thank everybody for uh, being on the webinar. I also want to uh, thank Dr. Fetter. Um, I think he's been uh, extremely uh, informative. And, you know, again, a, a great resource for DDA. Um, he's done, uh, you know, this is the second uh, webinar he's been on with us. We've asked him if he could, as we move forward, uh, have time available to continue uh, with us as we get questions. Uh, again, I can't stress enough, uh, please develop uh, relationships with your local health departments. Um, the, the other, the, group that we will be uh, continuing to uh, engage with and and work with um, and then and then the only other area that I would suggest is um, you know as I said earlier we're all in this together so you know we being DDAs the state the providers individuals people self-directing micro boards etc but I, I would strongly uh, urge the provider community, um, once you have, um, you know, a, an outbreak, because we know what the numbers look like in our 
uh, regions, et cetera, um, that we would basically go back and, and take a look at, like in the South region with the 56 confirmed cases, have the providers in, in that region or the 24 in Sierra Mara or the one in East or the eight in West reached out to the case management uh, entity rather than just, you know, I'm the provider and I'm here to do it alone so that you can have another voice through your uh, coordinator of uh, case management services, the CCSs, and, and basically start taking a look at, you know, collaboration, uh, you know, maybe the case management could be uh, advocating for you as a provider to the local health department, et cetera. So, you know, I think this is uh, something that we need to take a look at to make sure that uh, all parts of our system are informed and in, in, in assisting each other as we move forward. And with that, I'll close. Everybody be safe and um, have a good weekend, as good as we can. Um, and we will uh, obviously have uh, our next webinar on next Friday. So thank you.